everyone get their food, sign in, either now or later. There's two handouts. Good, good to go. So the agenda for today and our objectives are to give you an idea of how you would go about really preparing any application. Seven simple steps to preparing any kind of application, but of course we're going to be gearing this towards the mini grants. So initially I'm going to go over these tips, and of course they are related to the mini grants, um, but you can use them in other situations. Then we're going to go over the guidelines and what's new and different, especially for those of you who've applied before. And yes, anyone who applied before and uh, received funding or didn't receive funding can apply now. There's no restrictions as to who can apply and who cannot apply. And um, we'll go over all of the forms to make sure everyone's cool with that. And uh, then we have seven presenters. Uh, one from Borland and uh, six from here that are going to share their projects with you. Uh, three to four minute presentations and you'll have an idea of what's been funded in the, in the last round. Make sense? Any questions right now before we get started? No? Good. Okay. So the first step of any grant preparation process is to know the guidelines. And a lot of people will read the guidelines and then never read them again while they're doing the process. You should know the guidelines. So in the, in the case of the mini grants, we called it 2010-2011 mini grant guidelines. You can't miss it, okay? If you have an idea, the first thing is to develop your idea and think about who is going to need to be part of your project. If you do this in the order in which I'm sharing it, you will have a speedy and expedited process. If you decide that you have a better method of doing this, I will tell you that it will be very painful. So if you stick to the order in this, of the steps that I'm giving you, life will be good. Um, as soon as you have your idea and the kind of people you would like to have as part of your project, Give me a call or send me an email and we will meet and you will go, I'll, I'll give you a checklist of what exactly you have to do in what order and you should be fine. There's plenty of time between now and October 1st to do this work. So the sooner you have your idea and the sooner I get with you, the easier it will be for both of us, especially if everyone in this room decides to submit a proposal, right? So, step three is to create your timeline. Now, what that means is you're going to visualize the process of from birth of your project to death of your project to completion. And that means within that one year period of time, from, uh, from you'll be awarded November 1st, and we really do expect you to be done by October 1 of the following year. So you visualize this timeline, all the steps and all the people that are going to need to be involved with you and at what time these people are going to need to be involved with you. And this is a giant guess, right? You're just guessing. There's no right wrong. Um, I can help you prepare for this, no problem. Hopefully we didn't lose anybody. Hi, Katie, you still there? <laughs> okay, so then you take this timeline and you create a budget that feeds from your timeline. You can figure, you know how much time these people are going to be working, you figure out what, how many hours these uh, students are going to help you work or a consultant or when you need the equipment what equipment you need, and then you figure out how much it costs. If you can't figure it out, we will do it together, and I will work with finance to help get the numbers for you. So one thing we don't want is for everyone to be calling finance to get numbers. You would be calling me, and then I call finance, either Grace or Nadine Smith, and get the numbers for you, right? That's the best way of doing it. Then. After you've got your timeline and your budget, we have to decide 
Yes or no? Yes, this is feasible. Yes, this makes sense. Yes, this is not too expensive. Yes, this is not ridiculous. Um, it's not going to cost us $500 per student to train them to do something, right? We need to figure out if this makes sense to go forward or if we want to stop. And why do we do this this way? Most units on campus do not do feasibility. What they do is they start writing the narrative. And then when they're done with the narrative, they write the budget and their timeline. So they're already into it. They can't stop. They've committed too many hours. In this case, if we do it my way, you will be either into the project knowing full well that it's going to be tight and successful, or you're going to stop and you won't make anybody else go through any pain with you to prepare something that's not fundable. Make sense? So the reason why the library's grants program has been so successful is because we do this feasibility go, no go. And a lot of times we've said no go. Where's John Nemers? We did one with John and we said this is absolutely ridiculous. We're not going any further. And, um, and he's still willing to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> Step four. Now you're into the narrative. Now you're going to start answering the narrative questions that we have for you. These are just some really quick tips. You never want to use the words would, should, could, may, maybe, not sure, we're thinking about it. You write as though it's going to happen, even though you don't know whether we are all going to be on this planet when this grant period starts. Uh, you pretend as though this is reality and you write in very active verbs. This will take place and um, you will be successful. Funders do not fund people who are not sure that they know what they're doing, at least verbally. Um, pretend as though the reviewers have no idea about your project. So using technical terms, using terms that you use in your field is not appropriate for the reviewers. And less is more. If you use bullets, that's best uh, to describe what you're going to be doing. So when we say the word narrative, we're not saying that you have to write full sentences all the time. It's really great when there's white space, and it's really great when there's charts, and it's really great when you use bullets. 4.5. The reason this is 4.5 is because we want you to do this at the same time as you're starting to do your narrative. Um, it would be good if you figured out who's going to benefit from the project ahead of time. I mean, uh, as project people, sometimes we forget who's going to use or benefit from what you're doing. You need to know which courses are going to be using your materials, if it's new digital materials. You need to know which kind of students are going to use this information, which kind of faculty are going to use this information, or your new resources or your whatever. Um, and then we would like you to ask them for letters of support. So there's two kinds of letters or emails. There's the email that says, I'm committed to helping you do X, Y, Z, which says to the committee, you talk to the person, they said they would do it, and now they're committing in writing. A letter of support says, this is a great idea, I think you should do it, and this is why you should do it, and this is why it's significant, and why it's important. Okay? So, if you're creating this for all of, let's say, the Russian faculty, and this is um, a, a making uh, information available in Russia, in Russian, or making information available in Spanish, you want to make sure that those faculty members who would use this project result have given you letters that say, I will use this project result this way, or this is an important addition to um, our tool chest. Make sense? If you wait and ask for your letters in step five, six, seven, and eight, you won't have your letters, right? Because it takes time for them to do their, their work and get them to you. Step five. So you're going to complete with your team the first draft of your um, project and your project ideas and you're going to ask people for feedback. 
A lot of people don't like to do this because it makes them feel uh, inadequate or whatever that is all about. But um, it's feedback that makes the world go round and um, makes a really fundable application. Many times I send stuff out and I get, it's red when it comes back to me. And I usually think, wow, this is great. What, what help I've received from the angels out there. And now on your cover sheet, we'll go through the cover sheet, there's a place where it says initials. The person has to actually initial that they have agreed to provide you with help or resources. And that's on the cover sheet. And then you're going to get your letters of support, step six. Step seven, you work with me to refine your application because you, in any situation where you would be applying to an external funder, you would work with me anyway. That's why we don't have the committee members working with you because in a normal grant seeking process, the principal investigator, who is the person applying for the funds, works with me directly and the team works with me directly to prepare the final um, application. I do not vote in the review process. You know, I might clarify something, but uh, my role is a neutral player. So I'm working with everyone, I'm helping everyone. If you don't seek out my assistance, um, that would be um, actually uh, contrary to how the system works here, where the grants manager partners with the PI to prepare the proposal, regardless of whether it's a mini grant or an external proposal. And that's pretty much it. So let's go to the um, guidelines. I want to show you where this information is available online. So here you come to the second bullet, uh, or the second button here, using the libraries. Oh, I should ask, were there any questions for the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, and so it's the second bullet using the libraries, and we're down here at Grant Resources. You click here, come to the um, Funding Opportunities page for the libraries, and then over on the left you see Library Grants Committee, and you click there. So I should acknowledge the uh, Grants Management Committee members who are here, if you could raise your hand. Thanks for being here. We got three. Yep. And then uh, we have former members of the grants committee here as well. So, let's see if I can get. Here we are. So, these are the mini grants. Let's go here. How to apply. So your deadline is Friday, October 1st at by 5 o'clock. And we will now go to the guidelines. a separate, separate deadline completely, February 1st. The projects that we're going to entertain in the mini-grant program um, are up to $5,000, and the projects that we will entertain in uh, the Emerging Technologies Guidelines are up to $10,000. So if you click here, then you'll go to those guidelines and you can see what the difference is. Um, and we should do that. Um, for the ET, 
Funding is a separate category with the spring deadline. Emerging technologies funded projects will develop and or implement innovative tools and or functionality for libraries customers, including proposals that support research discovery and scholarly communication or collaboration. Applicants should avoid applying for projects which already have been implemented by several other academic libraries. Projects in a post-library 2.0 world that use existing, evolving, and or mobile technologies in new ways for practical application to library services fit well in this category. So that's the big difference between the mini-grants, which could be anything, and the emerging technologies category. So we have here the links to the proposals that were funded in the last cycle that you can take a look at. Um, the eligibility, this competition is open to any library staff, up to $5,000. Collaboration is mandatory. So the principal investigator is the person within the library who is a library employee and is the person in charge of leading the project. And the technical term for that is principal investigator. And that person is responsible for how the money is spent and for managing the project and starting and ending the project within the time period. It should take no more than 12 months to complete. And one change that we do have is that 10%, and you must get approval from all your library resource, resources who are going to contribute to your project. One change we have here is that 10% of the effort to complete the project must come from someone other than the principal investigator. That makes sure that you are collaborating. So that in order to determine what that is, I would work with you to, you would tell me, okay, these are the people on my team. I find out what their salaries are. You tell me how much time they're gonna be working and we get to 10% of the project. So if it's a $5,000 proposal, you need at least $500, right? Contributed from another person, at least. We would also like to know, and this is a change, what your effort as PI is going to be. How much time are you projecting you're going to spend working on this project? So, again, you would tell me how much time you think it's going to be, and we would do the calculation based on your salary and benefits. And then you would plug that into the budget. Uh, proposals with strong letters of support are more likely to be awarded than those without. That's something really important to remember. Now, the judging criteria, this is um, pretty much new. Uh, the proposal support for library professional activities that enhance access to an academic use of information or that support the instructional research and public service endeavors of the libraries and the university and the degree to which the proposal justifies a specific need for the project. Okay? That's the main thing that you're going to be judged on. Other aspects that you're going to be judged on. Is the presentation complete? Do you have your match? And do you ha have listed all of the necessary tools that you're going to need to make this happen? We would like to know um, from your application what you think the potential for long-term benefit will be for the libraries and for the university. And the last thing you'll be judged on is the degree to which the proposed project is innovative in terms of being the first or one of the first such projects in the country. Um, that would also give you higher marks. So you can identify your project as seed grant money, the $5,000. And uh, we know that uh, this is just the beginning of a bigger project, or it can be self-contained. It can have a beginning, middle, and an end, and that's it. Then you're done. So if for some reason you're doing a digitization project, then it needs to be determined whether that would be done in-house or whether it would use the Internet Archive um, as an outside vendor. And so if here are all of the guidelines for using Internet Archive, and um, we would work with you to determine that and work with the Digital Library Center and with Kathy Martiniak to make sure that you're uh, actually taking the right approach. 
Any questions on the guidelines? I'm going to move to the forums and then we will listen to the presentations by our guest presenters. Questions? <coughs> to pass? Yes. Um, you talked about uh, the uh, salaries and benefits. What's the formula for benefits? I do that. Huh? You don't have to do that. All I need to know is a percent of time that your people are going to be working on your project. And then I get it from finance. And then I give you the figures. And you plug them into your budget. Just and wondering how we figure out if it's $500 or whatever the percentage is if we don't know what the formula is. I give that to you and then we know right away. And in all of the grant seeking that we do in preparation, I'm always doing the budget with the PI and with finance. So um, it's nothing different than what we would do normally. What we try to do in this mini grant process is simulate actual development of a proposal the way we would do it for an external funder. Um, good question, though. Thanks. So here we go to the cover sheet. Loading. Everybody has a cover sheet um, that's next in the. Here we go. So we do want to know if this is the first time you are a principal investigator here at the University of Florida presenting a proposal for the first time for evaluation. That's important for the committee to know that you are learning from scratch. Okay? Um, so we need all this data, just how to find you. And then we want to know everyone else who is considered to be part of your project, meaning they're not just helping you, but they are part of your project team. They are committed, they are working active members of your project team pretty much throughout the project. They're just not a casual resource that you're having come in, help you, and then leave. So we want to know everyone who is considered to be you know, the other applicants in your project. And then we would like the title of your project. I can tell you that we've had some really good ones and we've had some that we had no clue. You should be able to see the title and visualize the project. So the title is probably one of the last things that you do. Right? And uh, that's what we normally do in the grants process as well, is make sure our title speaks to what the project says without having to read the proposal. Then we'd like a 100-word summary of what the project is, the amount you're requesting, how you're getting your 10%, and then this is where you have the list of some of the people, some of the departments you might need help from, right? And we've given you some empty spaces to fill in if you have other people that you have to contact or other resources that you need. And then they should physically approve this with their initials and then give the date that they authorized. That's it for the cover sheet. Any questions? Simple, right? Okay. Yes, Dan. One thing that's come up in the past, it's just worth, em worth emphasizing there, those 100 words are pretty important because sometimes that's all somebody knows about your project. Right, and it's a reminder. So if we've all, if the committee's all read the project last week and now, they're having to judge, they don't have the time to read it again. So those hundred words are, again, the last thing that you do. The cover sheet is not something you do in the front end. It's something you do kind of at the back end. Even though it looks really simple and, it's, and you want to get the simple stuff done, um, sim those simple things can really hurt you in the end if you don't have a good strategy. So this is the list of the questions that we have for you. Um, that you would answer in your narrative section that's no more than three pages, single spaced. And it should be legible. You would send your electronic copy to Suchi, who's my graduate assistant, and here's her address. So you're going to describe the project, its goals, and activities. You're going to state why the project is important. This is new. Compare and contrast the proposed project to other similar projects in academic libraries. Why did we put this in? 
because most grant proposals from external sources now mandate that you compare and contrast your program or your research or your project to what others have done because it's likely that they know about those projects and they want to make sure that you know about those projects and are not reinventing the wheel in a vacuum. So this takes a little bit of research, but you will learn a lot about what other, other institutions are doing. Um, briefly describe your, the resources that you need. What's your action plan? This should look like a plan, a chart with dates, just like a timeline. And activities and the people who are working in those. Yes. Can you briefly explain what people should do in order to get to the information about what other grants have been done, like what the major websites are? So, so yes. So it it, it well. Um, I don't know that we would anticipate that these projects would be these big projects that major funders would be putting on their sites. What I would anticipate is that there are other libraries through your connections or through connections with other librarians, or ALA is another resource, or ACRL, another resource, that would give you some idea of who else might have already done what you're thinking about. Or, um, and it's likely that your projects are going to be too small to appear in uh, IMLS, Institute of Museum Library Services, maybe in LSTA, um, we could look at the State Library and Archives um, list of funded grants and see if there's anyone in a public library or another academic library who's done that. Joe had a response. I, I would just recommend a general literature search. We're all librarians. Go to the library journals, go to academic journals, and look up your topic in the journals to see if anybody's written down a thing or two about them. Maybe you have a new angle to the project that wasn't discussed in the article or there was some conclusion they came to and you want to test out a new conclusion. So that's a great way to just follow up and try and find out if those have been done because if they've been done, people typically write about what they've done. Yes, and, and just be clear that you're writing about a project and not a grant, okay? So don't think grants, think projects. Um, let's see, the action plan. Um, if the project is, is to work with a collection, tell us about the collection. How are you going to measure your results? This is one of the hardest things that people, um, the time, it's difficult for people to do this part. And um, I will work with you on measurements and you can measure anything. You just have to figure out how. And you have to know what the possible results could be and the possible benefits could be. And when will you know those benefits? It could be way after you're done with the project. So it would be nice to know how are you going to capture those benefits if you're done with the project. Um, let's see. What are the long-term financial implications of the project if it's successful? So is there a future for this project? Um, is, would the library have to commit future resources to this project if you were successful? If you're going to be buying equipment, we want to know what's going to happen to the equipment when the project's finished, how will it be used, where will it live, who will check it out, how will people check it out. Um, then it, it, it says to fill out the budget. That's nice that we put that in the narrative. Um, don't forget to fill out the budget and um, the letters of support. Best. Yes. Well, the other thing about cost is the the important part is if you're going to start a project that the library has to maintain, what is that cost going to be to the library, and is the library willing to maintain that project? Exactly. The last element of the proposal. Hi, Bess. Yes. Sorry, I'm kind of time limited here. Yes. Um, I is it. We're, I'm, uh, I'm okay. done. Sorry. I'm done and we're going to go to you. Um, so here's the budget. I work with you to prepare the budget. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, so that's a one-on-one -on -one discussion and it's much easier than it looks. Okay. Kate. How do I transfer to Kate? Anybody? Um. We can push the content. 
Okay, we should move on to. Hold on a second. Services Librarian at Borland uh, here in Jacksonville, um, if anybody's aware of that. Uh, my, I'm the PI for the project which is called the Smartphone in Medicine, creating a mobile accessible website for clinical practice. Um, it was used, it was funded through the Emerging Tech Funds, um, it was a $4,500 grant. My co-grant uh, contributors is Ellie Bushhausen who should be there and she can wave. Um, and then the former co-worker of Marina Salcido, she's now no longer with UF at the moment. So just a brief little explanation. Um, so the idea for the project came from essentially it's a one-stop shop of mobile applications. Um, we wanted to create a, web create a website that would be available on multiple platforms including iPhone, Blackberry, the Droid, and Palm. Um, and we wanted it to be essentially a place where physicians, nurses, staff, uh, students, could go and look at all the available mobile applications um, for clinical practice or any of their disciplines. Um, so you can see that it covers multiple areas, um, including consumer health, that's another area. Um, so why do we need a website? Where did this idea come from? Um, we didn't do a formal survey or a test group. It really came from myself and Marina Salcido beginning to notice quite a few, or an increase in reference questions. Um, a lot of clinicians were approaching us, either in re uh, research councils, or when we were walking around the hospital, or even just sitting at the desk, um, saying, hey, I have a Blackberry, I'm a cardiologist, I need to know what's out there. Uh, the other thing that we began to notice also was an influx of mobile products. Um, MD Consult has come out with one for the mobile phone. PubMed is pushing not only PubMed Mobile, but also Medline Plus Mobile for the consumer. And then lastly, the uh, College of Pharmacy mandated that all incoming students for the class of, for in 2009, have an iPhone or an iPod Touch. And um, those students would be using that in the classroom. So we felt that the time was right for mobile, for a website of resources, essentially. Um, so this was the process that we went through. First of all, obviously we applied for the grant. Um, some of the steps that we took, that we outlined was the hiring of an outside web development firm. Um, we didn't, there wasn't anybody really at UF at that time who had the skills to design a mobile website of the uh, magnitude that we wanted. Um, so we got three proposals from local firms based in Jacksonville. Um, very easy, they actually have online forms that you can fill out asking for a price quote. Um, and we went with one called Integrated Webworks. Then the three of us started collecting mobile applications while that firm was um, presenting, or while that firm was designing. Uh, we used Google Docs, and I have a screen capture of what we did, um, and we divided it by device. Uh, I have a Blackberry, we also had iPod Touches, and then Ellie had a Droid. Um, the, last, the next step was also security clearance for the product because of the health science HIPAA protection, and that's been quite a battle, an interesting experience. Um, and then the next few steps were uploading the mobile information to the website and the promotion and evaluation of the site. Right now, we are currently at the final end of the security clearance. Um, all we've left to do is upload the mobile information. We've already done some promotion, which has been pretty well received. Um, so this is kind of a screen capture of the Google Docs spreadsheet that we used. Um, it's probably a little blurry on your end, and I apologize. But um, you can see that it's very detailed. I'm sure most of you have used Google Docs. It was very convenient. It's free. Um, since the three of us are distance, um, it was easy to update. Um, we had areas for descriptions, what devices it worked on, what exactly it contained, who was the, um, where the source of information came from, etc. And this is what it looks like on the iPhone. Uh, we did a couple of screen captures. We've been really impressed with the product, very impressed with the firm that we contracted with. Um, and we really feel like it's just snazzy looking and it includes all the information. Um, it has icons as to which device that the uh, app works for. Um, users can search either by the mobile application itself or they can search by categories. You can tag the applications. Um, it has a brief description of what the application consists of, as well as a link to directly go and download it. 
Um, for the back end to upload content, we, it's almost kind of like a blog format. Um, we wanted it for the we wanted it to be designed for the least tech savvy of staff members, so that anybody can use it. Um, it's pretty straightforward and simple. You can pick which devices it works for. Literally enter a brief description, and everybody is happy. It uploads immediately. So okay, so talk about the process that's happened. What went right? Um, so far, the promotions that we've done for it for the faculty, students, and staff, they're all really enthused about the product and really excited. We presented at some faculty councils and um, research councils. Everybody is on board and already asking us about certain devices and whether um, it works. So we are excited that that's what we, that it was something that people wanted. Um, it's also fairly cutting edge. A lot of libraries, we presented the project at the Medical Library Association's annual meeting, and a lot of libraries are um, developing apps for their library, but they're not collecting apps as a central location. And so a lot of our colleagues were interested in the project, they wanted to know um, whether or not uh, people could, um, you know, whether they could access, ac access it themselves. Um, so it's, yeah, it's become kind of a I, it was just a different angle on the mobile development than most other libraries have taken. And then the other thing is it's become part of larger projects involving mobile technology. In fact, Ellie Bushhausen is writing a paper right now involving the role of mobile technology in the health sciences. And um, we feel like it's going to be you know, a nice part of what UF will eventually end up doing with mobile technology. Um, what went wrong? <laughs> uh, the time frame, the timeline that Bess talked about is crucial and essentially whatever you think, however long you think it's going to take, it's going to take probably twice that long. <laughs> um, we, you're really ambitious when you write a time frame and it, yeah, things happen. Um, like for example, Marina left halfway through the project, so um, yeah, it just became a yeah, time frame essentially. Um, scope of the project, initially when we decided to do this, we were going to keep it to just free applications that anybody could access. and. Um, that was not feasible. We began to realize there were too many paid-for applications that were available um, that we needed to include that we thought our clinicians would use. Um, so now we've, you know, we've kind of broadened that. The other thing about the scope is that there are so many applications out there that you could collect for years and probably never um, fully get everything. So we had to cut ourselves off at some point um, and continue to kind of do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And then lastly, a lot of the applications for the databases that we subscribe to are not yet adaptable for large institutions, primarily RefWorks. They have, um, you have to give them an access code, which we don't use, so they're not IP recognizable. We get a lot of questions about that, and it's unfortunate that we have to tell them no. So hopefully that'll change, but that was one of the things that went wrong. And that's the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, or um, Ellie should also be there to help out. So Thank you. Learned a lot. We're going to switch over to our next presenter. Thanks a lot. I hope your class goes well. Thank you. <laughs> wait, wait. Bye. Were there questions? Are we good? Because we've got five other, six other people. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Next up can be Richard. Do you want to go next?
from Mexico and Cuba dating basically from the 40s and 50s and a few into the 60s. And uh, so certainly we were very pleased. We received them and they began to be housed in the Belknap collection, which is part of the Special Area Studies Department. And that was, uh, that is the collection for performing arts. So after a certain period of time of them being there and us examining them, uh, we were very pleased to see the announcement of the new mini grant project. So we thought, well, this would be a great thing. We could begin to do conservation work. And as we talked further about it, then we also began to talk about a digital uh, dimension to it. And then as we talked further, then we thought, well, we'll be adding metadata. And so consequently, it was a collaborative effort. And that's one of the great things about uh, the mini grant uh, program but also the libraries, and a lot of people are very willing to work together. And so uh, we applied for a mini grant and uh, began the work. Uh, we developed a budget. Beth was very uh, active in counseling us and uh, giving us good, uh, strong advice. Is that the plan? So this is off of the Latin American Collection homepage where you can access, not displaying very well, uh, because of the interface or whatever. But this professor, Efrain Barades, who's very active, very dynamic individual in the UF Department of Spanish and Portuguese, approached us concerning a colleague uh, that he uh, had a lot of communication with, Ramon Figueroa, who had spent much of his life collecting these film posters. So um, we began this project, and uh, let's see where this takes us. Um, some background on, on this is that the, the truly great collection of Mexican film posters burned to the ground in the early 50s in Mexico City in a terrible fire. So this has emerged as a great resource, not just for our campus, but beyond. And then going on the digital, it expands out a lot. And so we have uh, created this database with all the different posters that are scanned, and, and uh, there are several hundred of them. And this is, I have set two on the back table back there, and this is one of them, El Train Expresso, which, uh, let me have this open up, I think I can get a better idea of it. Uh, maybe I could go to one of the smaller sizes. <coughs> but all the uh, posters are in here, we made access points for the actors and actresses and the producers and directors and some of the artists. And so I've gotten a lot of feedback from people on campus. I had letters of support and encouragement from the Spanish department, but also from the art department and also from someone who's a film expert on campus who teaches film classes. And then also statewide from high school teachers, but also I had a, a lot of uh, positive support from a colleague at the University of New Mexico who has a similar accumulation of posters and really looked at ours as possibly a model of what they could do with theirs. And so it's been a great project. And you can see some of the, uh, the wear and tear on these, if you look where I'm pointing them. It, really, we needed to do something with this. We were delighted when the mini grant proposal uh, program came forward and uh, we uh, created a, a proposal. But again, I would conclude, because I know it would time uh, that if you have a, an idea, if you sense a need for something, or if you see an opportunity, uh, go ahead and talk to Bass or talk to others because it, it's really a great thing to, uh, to uh, get involved with. So does anybody have any questions? All right, thank you. Missy, would you come next? So my mini grant was for the library instruction how-to videos. Our objective was to use student assistance to create videos for purposes of library instruction. 
Uh, we knew that we wanted to manipulate the power of the peer, and students are really great at that. Students don't like anybody more than themselves. <laughs> um, peer learning, peer to peer sharing, uh, peers on teams working together for lots of different things. One student learns something from another student, that student passes it on and on and on. Students, we understand that students respect each other and they trust each other most of all. So Margo and I wanted to harness this power to benefit library instruction. Our students, uh, Nina, <laughs> Nina actually still works at MSL, so you guys can go visit her there. Um, Ferdos Faga, the incomparable Ferdos, and Pedro, the levitator. <laughs> um, these were, this was our team. And this slide shows some of their brain children. It's actually a total of 12 videos that we created. And Nina actually, sort of on the side away from the others, gave us the material to create one more uh, non-textual kind of a photo animated um, video. Um, importantly, what can uh, Margot and I, what can um, anybody sitting in this room, anybody on campus really do with these videos? You can embed them in your course guides or your subject guides, or students can use them in their own guides that they uh, will hopefully start to create. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're on the phone with a patron who is trying to figure out how to download that VPN, email them the link to, this, to the video on uh, how, to, how to do that. If you're on Ask a Librarian and you're with a patron who just can't get the hang of course reserves, Send them the link, push them the link to the video on you know, how, to, how to get started with course reserves, how to use it. It's the easiest way to give somebody good help. Uh, our next bridge to cross in the process is research. We've got a survey pending with um, the IRB office so that we can survey the first year Florida classes this fall so that we can actually evaluate the effectiveness of what we've done with these videos as online learning objects. Um, the survey will actually use the how to use off-campus access to do research from home video, the mobile and social tools at the UF Libraries video, and how to use course, how to use course reserves at the UF Libraries for the survey. Just three. We're actually beginning to find really useful in-house applications for these videos we created, and this is sort of a, a happy byproduct of the project. We didn't actually anticipate this at the time, but um, it's a happy circumstance that's coming up. Uh, this shows you, for example, you can create a QR code from any link, and this these two particular ones are examples um, that I created pointing to our video on how to move the compact shelving um, on YouTube. And so you can just imagine a student totally confronted by the compact shelving, how do I move these shelves, I don't understand the red blinky light. Um, they can pull out their mobile device, scan it, see, oh, there's a link on how to do this, and watch the video right there. What would we have done differently? We would have asked for more money <laughs> so that we could have continued on with this because as we discovered, it was a really good thing and the students were just brilliant and so creative and fun and really self-sufficient learning units. So I, it got to the point where we would just say, our next idea is this. And they would say, okay, we got it. And they would just do everything. And they were so good that we trusted them with that. And of course there was guidance all along the way, but yeah, we, we really uh, regretted not having enough funds to, to continue on with our students. But um, best piece of advice I can give for mini grantors, um, everything best said, take it to heart. Missy, where are these on the um, library website? Well, a couple of them are on various libguides. Uh, they're all on our UF Library YouTube channel. Okay. So, that will work. Any other questions? You, 
Did yeah. you use flip videos of those, right? Flip uh, cameras? We used a, a variety of media, Joe. Um, one of them, the how to use how to print in the library, uses a combination of screen capture and a flip video. Uh, the how to use the self checkout machine uses a flip video camera. Um, other videos use that camera in the back. <laughs> So it's just the, the your grant purchased some equipment? No. No, it didn't purchase any. The original plan was to um, do that, but it got switched in the process of applying. So um, we actually were only funded for, to pay the student assistance. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, my uh, mini grant was in 2008. Uh, it was for the digitization of the historic St. Augustine block and lot files. Uh, what this what this kind of fell into my lap, sort of thing. Uh, in my capacity as the liaison for uh, historic preservation and art, art and history museum studies, um, I was working a lot over in St. Augustine at the government house on some projects, and it turned out that there was this kind of orphan collection. Uh, that was developed by the Historic St. Augustine Preservation Board. Um, it was kind of a file cabinet, basically a vertical file cabinet, and it was organized according to these blocks and lots. Uh, so each successive preservation board uh, would organize this file material uh, so that you know historians could do their research, uh, archaeologists could file their uh, site reports uh, according to these blocks and lots. So. I came up with the idea to see if we could uh, maybe digitize some of this material. And uh, basically it's just a collection of, you know, architectural sketches, drawings, photographs. I mean, there's things on like onion skin, typewritten paper. I mean, it was kind of a mess. Um, and, based, and also, just so you know, the file cabinet had apparently fell over at some point over the years. <laughs> uh, so it was in a real mess. So even just to describe this generally was going to take some time. Um, so the idea to you know digitize it to where it was accessible, but keyword that sort of thing seemed pretty obvious to me. Um, but it was going to take you know some time and effort and money. So uh, doing some calculations, just thinking about uh, how much material there was. There was space. I guess there was around ten to twelve thousand documents within these boxes. Um, so calculating, you know, how much time, you know, I talked to Lori and Lourdes and Dina, you know, DLC to try to figure out how much time does it take to scan these sorts of things. Uh, I kind of did it backwards to see how much it would take, how much time it would take to um, digitize this material. So, um, came up with the idea that it, I could get maybe about 85% of the collection um, digitized. Um, and if we were able to do that, then you know, here's a hidden collection that would be given universal access via the web. Uh, we would actually be preserving some of these delicate documents from future overuse. Um, it would support the academic research programs of UF, which is really key. And it could also, you know, of course, lead to other funding opportunities. It also happened to coincide with some state legislation that happened in 2007, which actually gave the University of Florida 32 state properties over in St. Augustine. So I thought, well, this is just everything, a confluence of you know, all these things coming together. So it seemed very important in that and still is. So came up with a plan of action. Uh, basically, you know, I was gonna hire a graduate student because I felt that, and this was actually a graduate student who had worked with John Nemers. She was very um, you know familiar with historic documents and archived, archival materials, so she knew how to handle it. Um, she would be able to describe the materials, you know, effectively. And so that's what I came up with. Um, afterwards, this is from my final report. All these materials are also in the institutional repository. If you go in and do a search under my name, Caswell, you'll find my application for the grant, the interim report, and my final report.
So the collection actually now contains over 18,135 image files as of yesterday. Uh, some of these files are still loading, <laughs> even though it ended, you know, we stopped digitizing last year. Um, some of these things take some time, as I find out. So. Um, some of the things I learned from doing this uh, was to, you know, definitely, I would highly recommend seeking advice of colleagues and listen to what they have to say, because they've been there, done that sort of thing. Absolutely build flexibility into your plan of action, because um, that's, you know, just gonna, you don't want to get boxed into a corner. And be prepared to roll up your sleeves and jump in. Um, oops, go back. Um, because I did find that at times, like when my grad student, you know, in between breaks, you know, there are weeks where, you know, summer break vacations, those sorts of things, where I'm like, this stuff has to be digitized. I only have this much amount of time. So I actually would go in there and just like, you know, I would either take staples out so that it was ready for when she came back or, you know, describe some of the materials. So it was definitely hands on, uh, probably more than I thought it was going to be. Uh, so that's definitely a thing to consider. Don't underestimate your OPS funds if you're, that's what you're asking for. Uh, I did find that, uh, that it got eaten up a lot faster than I was expecting. Um, so definitely ask, especially lawyers, about how much to pay your student. Um, but I was, you know, definitely paying my student a little more because she was doing descriptive data, that sort of thing. So if there's things that you can maybe do and then just have the person just, you know, scanning. I don't know. Uh, and definitely monitor your funds. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, invoke the power and say goodbye to Vesta Farber. <laughs> she is probably the, the most valuable thing uh, we have going as far as grants and grant writing. Um, because now, using this as a seed grant, um, I've just recently submitted with J John Nimmers and Jim Cusick a, um, an NEH grant for $350,000. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll hear about that next year as a successful grant. And it'll all be because the mini grant is down. Any questions? Comments? I have a comment. Um, I just went to the Florida Historical Society meeting, and the archaeologist of, of the city of St. Augustine made a presentation using some of these materials um, in his presentation about you know what the layers of history are underneath the streets of St. Augustine. It was fascinating. Everybody was like knocked out by this presentation. Yeah, Carl is really great. I got to work closely with him during my sabbatical, and he's actually one of our partners in the NEH grant, so if that's uh, successful, a lot of his material will be part of that grant, because we are definitely getting into the uncovering layers of history over at St. Augustine. So, it's really exciting stuff. And also, just so you know, that I did eat up the 5,000 very easily to do the 85 <laughs> So, so just, uh, you know, have to go give a full disclosure here. Um, I did get, uh, as I was promoting the collection over in St. Augustine during my sabbatical, I did have someone donate $200 anonymously because they were wanting to, you know, get the last 15% scan. I'm like, well, $200 isn't actually going to get the remaining 15% scan. So I approached the deans and, uh, you know, I figured that it would probably take another $1,000. Um, so coupling that $200 donation with a generous $100 more from the deans, I was able to completely digitize 100% of the collection. So that was really great. So, anything more? So the, is, the Institutional History Project, I almost say Institutional Repository just by default now, it's not the words, <laughs> uh, as you'll notice we have technically people from three different departments, the Digital Library Center, Mark Sullivan is in IT, even though his office is upstairs with us, and also Special Collections. So what's in the name? Does anybody know what's happening on this screen right here, besides a bunch of places people things that you might have a degree in. 
They're all dead. They're all dead. Well, they're not, they're not dead, just the names. The names are dead, but the names live on in history. All these functions continue to exist right now. Normal college, would you know that that's education? Maybe not, so maybe we need to have a way that you know that. This is what we look like right now. Also, if you'll notice, university seal, you're not supposed to use it, but it's dead, so I'm pointing that out. Uh, you have monogram and all of our colleges. So how did we get from there to here? Well, even just in 50 years, using the university record, which has been completely digitized and is in the institutional repository, <laughs> this is where we went, slowly, gradually. And even, you'll notice in the 1960 to 61 division, we have some things that are quite a bit different from the way things are now. Physically, if we need any further illustration, we've come a long way, baby, so let's keep going. How do we make sense of all these things, looking at the history? How do we get it all on one, one big place where everybody can look and know that somebody who knows something has looked at it and said, this is correct, this is how it have evolved. So we hired two student assistants in special collections to identify names, dates, transitions, and error changes from authoritative sources in the university archives. We also used the great wisdom of our friend and colleague, Carl Van Ness, to clarify any confusion in the middle. Um, and then John Nemers encoded the information to create web pages using EAC CPF standards in XML, which I'll show you guys in just a second. So then over in the DLC, Mark, with, these, with the help of a programming assistant, created software that will integrate the EAC CPF standards into the UFDC records. So when you look at the citation, the citation page for a, a document in UFDC, you'll also see a link to, once it's integrated, you'll see a link to the, the, greater, the greater being that is that body. So because they were completed with that aspect sooner than expected, they added EAD capabilities too, which is the historic archival description. So this is what the ACCPF looks like. It allows for relationships to be demonstrated. You can see that these are, these are the children. These are children of the College of Education, uh, departments and offices, and the years in which they existed. Who cares? <laughs> Special <laughs> Collections cares, so everybody should care. The Digital Library Center cares, and we serve you guys, so we care. Vivo cares. As Vivo creates the social network and we want everybody to be linked up where they belong, they care. Also the provost office. Would you believe that nobody has any sort of concise documentation of the transitions over time? This is believable. It should not be believable. So now, now we have it for them. These are the expressed interests when we were creating the grant. We're hoping also that the Alumni Association will benefit this. Also. Hopefully we'll have it somewhere in the background of Mango. The thing to understand about a lot of what we do in the DLC is maybe you don't see you don't see what makes it go, but we're working hard on stuff that makes it go and makes it go better and makes your results better. So how does this apply outside? Well, has anybody heard of Snack? Snack, Social Networks and Archival Context Project. This is an NEH funded project happening across the country. You'll notice in the right-hand margin that we have some pretty big folks. They are using EAC CPF to clarify for all sorts of institutions, their histories, what they do, and where they're going. So I have some outside reading if you guys would like to see what we're up to, where we're going. Um, as Richard said, sometimes one of the great pains of proving that a technology is emerging and understand that part of this was funded under an emerging technologies grant in a way that they aren't funded anymore. Um, it's hard to prove that something is emerging. If you have proof, it has emerged. <laughs> if you don't have proof, I, I can say, Judy, really, I swear. Um, and Michelle Crump was very patient and we had a number of back and forth conversations about I'm not kidding. So luckily, you know, this whole snack thing is going on. We have a little validation in the world. Um, so we're hoping for further implementation. This is going, right now it's just basically, we have a whole lot of this. 
So how do we get this from this to UFDC records and to catalog records? I guess we'll find out. Stay tuned. Thank you, Dina. Knudsen is going to present, and she's one of our newest faculty on um, on her project. I've got to put it on the computer. Yes. Stacy, can you help her a little bit? So Artbound is the name of this uh, competition that I, I'm running and, and in the process of putting up the exhibition upstairs. Um, it's a collection of student-made artist books. Um, I, I sort of, when I saw the mini grant, I thought, is this a way? Could I, you know, try to make, I was here for maybe three months and realized there's not a whole lot of artist books. There's a lot of book arts materials, which is, you know, uh, printing history and type specimen books in the collection in special special collections. My position is associate in book arts, so I actually have ink on my hands right now because I was teaching letterpress in the art department this morning. Um, so uh, my goal was to try to come up with a call for entries and design this call for entries um, to get students to submit their work and then we would then, UF would then have a small collection of artist books that students could handle and also that they could understand. Because sometimes they'll see these really fine press produced artist books that are sort of, they seem out of reach. They're just so perfect that they just start to seem undoable. Um, so I thought maybe this would be a way that U.S. could kind of get known for having artist books and for being interested in artist books. Um, so, the project summary and goals is acquiring artist books created by grad students in book arts programs in the U.S. through a call for submissions, juried. This was then juried. So we got, I sent out the call for submissions and I got, I had to do two <laughs> calls because it was the beginning of the spring and the timing wasn't exactly right. Uh, for students that finishing up their books were able to say they could do it. So I extended a little bit, so I got more. In the end, I got about 90 submissions. Um, and then we had a juried um, group. It was myself, Ann Lindell, Lauren Lake, and Brian Slauson from the art department. Um, and we looked at these images of the, of the books and chose the best. We voted and, you know, I came up with a way to to judge these books. Um, and that was one thing I would change for the future is to maybe be able to look at the actual book instead of a picture because sometimes that can make or break um, the book being chosen or not. Um, so the exhibition is going, going to happen September 1st. It opens and it'll be open for a month. And it's the 33 books that we selected. There was a first, second, and third place and they, there was a purchase award, and then um, the rest of the books were purchased, but only for a set amount of money. So they, they got, they, the benefit to the student, uh, to the grad student, is that they get their work in a major institution. Um, there's gonna be a, a website, just a real simple website for it. That's in the works too. And then I'm thinking about doing a blurb.com book, I've got an exhibition catalog. And the way that works is the only investment would be my time into making a PDF and having this book available for purchase. So there's no cost involved up front. Um, so I, I think I've kind of already explained the rationale for it, but I'll just I'll read this anyway. The exhibition and acquisition of contemporary artist books created by grad students will invigorate the libraries and introduce US students to a broad range of books being produced by peer artists. Again, when I think somebody was saying the peer-to-peer -peer thing that they that they don't like anybody better than themselves, that's very true. They can understand, I mean, and the books are, are more simple, like I was saying, than a fine arts, uh, a fine press edition of a book, um, so that they're easier to understand and more accessible. Um, and then I think I had 
images. Oh, call for entries. Um, so I did a call for entries, and as a book artist myself, I'm a book artist, um, I've done a lot of juried exhibitions. And so I kind of looked around at a few different calls for entries, you know, and I thought, this is the one I thought was the easiest. And so I kind of looked to other examples to put together a good call for entries, and it, it worked really well. I was, I was glad with that. Um, collection of the entries, that was an interesting procedure because I was just hoping that they were going to send me their stuff, and they did. And then when I uh, we picked the books and I, let, I notified people, most people were pretty good about getting me their books. I was a little concerned that some people wouldn't want to do it if they didn't win or whatever, but it, it turned out really well. Um, and then some of the books needed to be photographed. The three winners, the three, the top three winners were photographed for a digital collection. Uh, and then I needed to photograph some of the books because the photos weren't good enough um, for putting on a website. So we did that. And then I've worked on the exhibit design and the logo and all that stuff too. And I don't know what I would do differently except for maybe looking at the physical book. But that's a lot to ask. People, that's a risk for, for an artist to take to just mail someone their book. That's my only hesitation with doing that. Is I, don't, I don't know that I get as many entries. And so I, but I do hope I get to continue this. And I, I put some of the images in. This is uh, the second place winner. Um, there's another shot of it, and I can just go through these pretty quickly. But this, like this one is Memphis College of Art. There's another shot of it. This is a flag book. These are all going to be upstairs in the exhibition. This is a little tunnel book. And they're all reproduced in different ways. Like I, I letterpress print all of my books. But some of these are done with letterpress. Some are screen printed. Some are inkjet printed. And some are combinations of those things. This is a tablet magazine that is just drilled. This is a, sort of a, an example of a commercial book, but it's, it's an artist book because it's handmade. And oh, there's a lot of handmade paper in the books that you're going to see, so. Yeah. A question uh, just came to mind as you're talking about would it be copyright and royalties. Is there, is there any of that that you came across in having to work with in the what, artists? In what way? Well, uh, somebody's submitting their own personal work, so I would imagine that belongs yep. to them in some fashion, so there's copyright with that. And then if you're thinking... You mean to put it on a website? Well, website, exhibition, I mean, there's... Well, I mean, there is... When, when the student had to fill out their call for entries, they had to sign, you know, their call for entries saying that I give you permission okay. so to show basically. and photograph. Yeah, that's all... Yeah, that's an important part of, of a good call for entrance is that kind of release. Yeah, so we did that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you didn't mention, you also put in some income. The fees. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, yes. There was a, a, a fee for the call for entrance. That's true. I forgot about that. There, um, it was 20 or 25 I think it was $20 entry. And they could enter one to three books, up to three books. Yeah, we made a little money doing that, doing it that way. Because, and that's a standard operating procedure for a call for entries and for juried exhibitions. That's the deal. Great. We have one more, and we'll be out on time. Thank you so much. Okay, Stacy.